ಚಿಕ್ಕಿಯ ರಾತ್ರಿ ನೈ ಬಿಹಿಯ ಚಿಕ್ಕಿಯ ರಾತ್ರಿ ಹೈರಿ ಹೈರಿ ಹಾರಿಯ ಚಿ ರಾತ್ರಿ ಇನ್ ಟು ಆರ್ಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಇಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಗ್ಯಾದರ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಆರ್ಸ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ನಹಿ ಅನ್ನ ಕ್ಯ ಕೌತ ನೌ ಮೈ ಹರ ಮೈ ಅರ್ಥಿ ನ ಕೌತ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಸೀ ಹಿಯರ್ ದಟ್ ಚು ನೈ ಮೊರಿ ರ ನಹಿ ಅನ್ನ ಕ್ಯ ಕ್ಯ ರಂಗಿ ನೂ ಯೆ ತು ಯು ನೈ ಕ್ಯ ಪಾಪ ಚು ನು ಕು ತಕ ತು ಆಕಿ ನೈ ನಾ ರಾವ ನೈ ತು ಓರಂಗ ಓತ ತಂಗ ತ ಮೊರಿ ರ ತು ಕು ನಾ ರಂಗಿ ನೀ ಕಿ ರುಂಗ ಅಕಿ ಪಾಪ ಚು ನು ಕಿ ಕಿ ರ ರು ಆ ಬುತ್ ತು ಫೈ ಯೋ ತಿ ಹೋ ಮಾರ ಮ ನೋರೆ ರ ಫಕ ತಕ ತ ಹೌ ಕಿ ತಿ ರು ಫಕ ತಕ ಹೌ ಕಿ ತಿ ತೋ ಆ ಕಿ ಮಾ ಕಿ ನ ಕಿ ನ ಕಿ ಯೋ ಚ ಆ ಕಿ ಮಾ ತರ ತರ ಕಿ ತೈ ಕಿ ಹಿ ಆ ಕಿ ಅನ್ನ ತಿ ಆ ಚು ಕುರ ಹೆ ಚಿ ಯೋ ಹೆ ಹೋ ಕ ಹೆ ಹೌ ಹೌ ತಿ ಹೈ ಮೌ ಯೋ ರ ನೋರೆ ರ ತಿ ನ ಕೌ ತೈ ತಿ ನ ಕೌ ತೈ ಆ ಕಿ ಯೋ ರ ತ ಕಿ ರ ತಿ ರು Ask the speakers to hold the microphone in front of their mouths, and then those of us who are hard of hearing will know why we came tonight. Perfect. How's that? That's much better. Um, also, a request from me: if if it's a little bit difficult to see or hear, um, you can move your you can. There's a bit of room up the front here if you'd like to move a little bit further forward. Up. Uh, Evening everybody, evening again. My name's Paul Kleinick. I'm the Acting General Manager for Engineering and Technical Services um, within Auckland Council. Keep that away from that. Um, my role is the sponsor for the coastal management planning work that we're going to be talking um, about tonight. Um, I'm also here as the MC for this evening's event. Um, this evening's event is, is not just what we're doing here in person tonight, um, we're also live streaming this event. So live streaming and recording this event Um, to upload to Council's YouTube channel. Um, the link for that um, website is at the bottom of our slides this evening. And for those that are joining us online, um, you have an ability to ask questions, um, but we won't be able to interact with those questions um, straight away this evening, but we're going to come back to those questions um, and provide a response over the coming days. Um, a little bit of housekeeping um, from me. Um, in the event of an emergency, Um, you'll want to make your way, or follow the RSA staff, make your way back out through the doors that you came in, out to the car park, there's an assembly area there. Um, for those that need to use the bathrooms, they're, they're right out the door that you came in there, um, directly on your left. Um, the format for this evening is, is what you, you might not be able to see this at the back, but um, top right for the slide. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna work our way through some introductions from the local board chair, Um, and from your local ward councillors, um, some discussion around um, coastal management principles um, and the input that we're expecting or, or, or requesting from the community. We're going to talk a little bit about adaptive planning, but importantly for this evening, we want to leave enough time um, for you to ask us some questions so we can provide some answers. Um, I think it's important to note that this is the, the first presentation of a series of presentations and open days for the Whanga Prao community. So it, this conversation will be building and momentum and content as we move forward. Tonight is very much around an introduction to the principles, um, what we're seeking to achieve uh, within council, working with mana whenua and our local communities. Um, so on that note, I'd like to invite um, Gary Brown, who's the chair of the Hibiscus and Bay's local board, um, just to help with some of the welcome for this evening. Thanks, Gary. Yes. Okay. Kia ora, welcome everybody. Um, hey, it's, it's quite exciting when, when we look at what we're going to be doing here as a pilot, um, which could be for the rest of New Zealand and Whangapurau. We've got more beaches than I think anyone could ever speak of. I think, how many are there? About 20 something or is 14? 14, it's incredible, isn't it? How many beaches we have. And I think it's important that we look at the pros and cons of what we're trying to establish here. Um, with the erosion that's going on in our area, as you know, with Oriwa and uh, Whangapaa. And uh, there's also been some work out at Stanmore Bay, which has been quite productive in a way that Paul's been uh, dealing with as well. But I think, uh, hey, welcome, and we want to hear from you. We want to hear your pros, we want to hear your cons, uh, and get a really good assessment of where we're going to go to and lead us into what our next step is. Um, so it is exciting to be a pilot, and uh, let's hope it uh, comes out really, really uh, positive. So thanks very much for having us here. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Gary. So, just on to introducing um, Council's. Oh, I won't go that way. Just on to introducing Council's project team. So, you'll see from this slide 
there are quite a few people involved within Auckland Council itself and also within our CCOs, our council controlled organisation. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce um, some of the project team that's here this evening at the front table that are going to be helping with the presentation this evening. What I'm going to do is just pass the mic over to them and get them to introduce themselves, where they fit in within council, um, and you'll be hearing more of them, um, or more from each of them, as we work our way through tonight's presentation. Kia ora everybody, my name is Tracy Howe and I'm a Principal Coastal Hazard Specialist and I work with Paul and I program manage the uh, coastal management plans um, process essentially um, and I'm very happy to be here, looking forward to it. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Lyford, I'm a Parks and Places Specialist with Auckland Council. Um, I've been working uh, in and around the parks in Rodney and Hibiscus and Bays um, for the last uh, since 2009, I've been involved with a lot of uh, coastal projects um, from Uruwai um, to um, uh, Snails Beach and say, um, Sandspit and all around the place, um, and more and more now in the Hibiscus and Bays. So. Kia ora tātou, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Ryan Hamill. I'm the Technical Director for Coastal Engineering for Tonkin and Taylor. Um, I've been working in coastal hazard and coastal processes um, since the 80s. It makes me feel quite old. Um, it, it's something that I was passionate about at university. I uh, worked first on Mission Bay for Auckland Council looking at the erosion problems um, there. I, I was lucky enough to spend four years at Delft Hydraulics in the Netherlands doing global research work for all kinds of hazard and erosion problems and ended up with Tom Container in 1994 and I've been working for them since then as a coastal engineer um, a coastal hazard specialist looking at um, coastal hazard strategies in the Hawke's Bay and um, yeah, family live up in Bongapra, it's a place I try to learn how to paddleboard and surf it's a, a place I've got a really close um, affection for, thank you Thanks Richard um, we've also got some other council staff scattered throughout the, um, the crowd this evening that will make themselves known to you as um, the night progresses um, and they'll be available to help with some of the questions and answers as we um, progress through the evening. Look, before we kick into the presentation proper, um, I'd, I'd also like to introduce um, your local ward councillors, Councillor Walker and Councillor Watson. Um, I've asked them to come along this evening um, to speak to some of the regional context related to climate change um, and importantly to overview some of Auckland Council's response um, to that challenge and to that risk via the climate change plan um, which has come on the back of Auckland Council's Climate Change Emergency Declaration. Um, so over to you, Councillor Walker. Sure, so I'm Wayne, and we've got John Watson here. Paul's right, our council, together with a whole lot of councillors, councils declared a climate change emergency not so long ago, and so has the government. And there are a couple of aspects to how we deal with that. One is around mitigation, that's trying to prevent climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the other part is adaptation, how we cope with climate change and this process is very much around adaptation. Because sea level rise, temperature rise are locked in and we know that we're going to have ongoing issues for many years to come. This particular process is, from my perspective, a conversation and it isn't necessarily going to throw up definitive answers because the situation is going to be changing all the time. And this process comes about through some work that the Ministry for the Environment has conducted called Dynamic Adaptive Pathways. And it's a process around engaging with communities, getting response, getting people also to take responsibility for things that they can do, making people aware of things and using various tools like the King Tides Initiative. And I can see that there are some people, I think, involved with King Tides that are, are here, some good people involved with that. And that initiative is about the impact of King Tides, which are the high tides that occur every now and again, and basically saying that those King Tides are going to be the normal tides in not too many years' time, and that hopefully reinforces where things are at. So this is an important process. It's really important to get engagement because the idea is for local communities to take responsibility themselves 
as much and all as the council because it's council's problem but it's all our problem. John, over to you. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think that's a pretty good explanation. I don't think I can add too much to that. Um, uh, other than to say that, that just certainly over the last few years I've noticed the things on the ground around Whanga Price. I live along uh, out of the wilds of Army Bay and, and certainly the last little while you know, we've been getting a coastal infrastructure smash. So um, you know the s steps and stairs have just been getting taken out and they'll get repaired and then another big storm event will come in and they'll, they'll get smashed again. So I'm certainly really interested in, in getting or well, listening to what you know people's perspective is from residents. I was at Neighbours Day party um, in the weekend, um, which is which is a great event uh, by the way. And you see people who live 50 metres away from you, you never talk to, and have been living there 20 years. But any anyway, the topic of the the, the community swimming spot came up, which is this lovely little. Uh, ramp that goes down that, that has to have a big fence on it to stop you know kids falling over and stuff and it gets it, it gets blasted so every couple of years it just gets smashed to smithereens and um, you know the council will dutifully come along and um, <laughs> fix it up though it's taking longer and longer because this is occurring more often um, but well a, a couple of the guys there were engineers um, and they said, well, you know, um, okay, yeah, that structure's okay, but if, you know, if we wired this tension wire around here and we wrapped it around this pillar here and, and attached it to this bit at the top, that'll stop it. And, um, and it'll cost, you know, uh, next to nothing to do that, you know, this piece of strengthening wire. And I thought, geez, I'll, you know, I wonder if anyone in the council has, ha has thought about that, that kind of response, you know, maybe maybe they have, maybe they haven't. But what Wayne and I certainly know over many years is that we have people with great expertise within our own community uh, who, who know the areas where they live, they know what happens, and, you know, sometimes they've got the solutions and um, we should be listening to them. So um, I, I thank you for our experts coming along, but um, and I'm interested to hear what they've got to say, but I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear the questions that, that come from the floor. And, Thank you everyone for, for turning up and I hope it's going to be a, um, a good couple of sessions over the next week while. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank Councillor Walker and Councillor Walker for coming and um, as you heard, we're in a position where we're already seeing some of the impacts of things like climate change and coastal erosion and some of these hazards and people see that um, and there is a need for us to consider that these things are going to increase over time and that we need to really kind of have a plan of what we're going to do. We can't reactively manage things forever. We need to kind of focus on organizing ourselves and putting things together in a way that makes sense uh, for council but also for the local communities. And so, you know, we are very interested to hear how you guys value the areas that you live, how you, how you utilize the coast. So that when we make these decisions, they take that into account. Um, so in terms of planning for the future, council has some statutory requirements that we have to meet. You know, our, our local government act requires us to mitigate risk where we can. The New Zealand coastal policy statement requires us to plan for the 100 year time scale for that very long term. Um, and we also have a coastal management framework which identifies some of the issues that we have along Oxen's coastline and also some of the potential solutions. And one of the things it recommended is that we come and talk to the communities and go through this process of looking at the coastline in a long-term adaptive way. Now this is a picture from Fungna Pro in the 1950s. As you can see, very different from today. Lots and lots of open space. If we add on the roads, and then we add the most recent aerial photograph from 2017, what you can see is it's extremely different, right? We've added a huge amount of houses into this zone. And it's a great place to live, lots of beaches, wonderful, beautiful landscape. Also, coastal processes are impacting these communities, are impacting you guys. And um, as council, we need to manage that. We need to plan. So that's why we're here. Now, in terms of what are coastal management plans, they're adaptive, long-term plans. By adaptive, this is what you heard Councillor Watson and Walker, apologies, uh, speaking about. Um, these are the plans that allow us to make different decisions based on what is happening. We don't know what the future with climate change actually looks like. We have an idea, we have an understanding of some kind, 
but we have a lot of uncertainty. And so we have to have some flexibility in our plan to allow for that, to allow for us to make different options when things change. So that's the adaptive side. The long term is that the decisions that we make now are going to impact us for, the, for a very long time going forward. So we need to make sure that we account for that, that when we think about this, we're thinking in those timescales. And that's the 100-year timescale that we're planning to. Now, in terms of this, we're talking about council-owned land and assets. That's where we start. That's what we can talk about. That's what we need to understand and get our heads around. Um, and what we're looking at is how coastal hazards, catchment flooding, and climate change are going to impact those things. And of course, those are the things, so when we talk about coastal assets, those are the things that the community uses. Those are your, your toilet blocks, your beaches, uh, your reserve areas. And so we need to understand how you value those things, how you use those things, so that we can plan accordingly. Now, this project is co-designed with our treaty partners, um, and we're working through the regional kind of coastal process um, of the management plans with Mana Fenua. And you might be wondering why, why we're doing a pilot. You've been hearing that word quite a lot in terms of this is a pilot. Well, as you've heard from a lot of people, this is a complex space. Coastal processes are complex. Coastal hazards are complex. The, the ways that communities value and use this space are complex. And so we're not going to get this instantly right from the beginning. We need to trial a process to see if it works. And so that's what we're doing. We're trying this process. And we'll be iterating it and refining it as we go along. And once we're sure that it works and we're getting the outcomes that are functional, what we're going to do is then scale up and start doing coastal management plans across the coastline for Auckland. Now, coastal management plans provide these site-specific pathways for different areas of the coast, but they don't set budgets. They're not actual asset management plans. We can't make those decisions for the region of Auckland until we have done all of the CMPs. And that's a big process, because we've got 3,200 kilometers of coastline to look at. So it's going to take us about three to five years to understand all these areas, to go through. And once we've done that, we'll then be able to create a regional framework where we can start to look at how we prioritize these things. How much money is it going to cost for us to manage this in the way that is right? Um, and so that's our regional coastal asset management plan, which is the final result of the whole long journey that we're on. Um, so you might be wondering, why did we pick Fungapro for the pilot? Um, in terms of trialing a process, right, for coastal management, we're looking at the coastal processes, and you guys have a great mix. You have a lot of different beaches, a lot of different cliffs, different exposure to waves, quite a lot of different environments. So very challenging from the coastal engineering perspective for us. But also, you know, we do have a variety of different kinds of the assets that we own here. So we get to test out these things on all the different asset types that we're looking at. And the other thing that you have is you're very strong and established communities. So while we're working this through with Manifenua, we're also talking to you about what you value. And it's good for us to talk to communities that are well knit together. Now, what are we talking about when we're talking about council owned land and assets? The first thing is, of course, we're talking about the public land. So we're talking about your parks, your reserves, your public beaches, your stormwater reserves. And that's the areas that are shown in yellow. Now, when I add these red lines, these are your seawalls and your revetments. These are the coastal structures that basically protect the certain spaces. Now, if we add on all the other assets, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so this is what a seawall looks like. This is what a rock revetment looks like. Now, if we add in all the other assets, you're looking at your wharves, your boat ramps, and your coastal stairways. Now, altogether, Fangaparilla has about 160 of these assets that we need to look at and we need to assess what we're going to do with, how we're going to manage them, what that's going to look like. So it's a big task. Now, in terms of the hazards that might impact these assets that we're talking about, you have coastal erosion, which is the wearing away of the land due to the natural coastal processes. So this is where basically the sea slowly or quickly, depending on the storm event, and that's a picture from the 2018 storm in Stanmore Bay, it actually just wears away the land. So the land starts to go away over time. Coastal inundation is another word for coastal flooding. And this happens when, during a big storm event, the water level rises because of the barometric pressure, and you actually flood the landscape. Catchment flooding, is inland flooding that occurs from general rainfall. 
Now you might be wondering why catchment flooding is included in the coastal plan, but it's because the catchments can actually come from the back and flood assets that are by the coast. So we need to make sure that we're incorporating what we know about all the hazards. Um, and if you want to know more about coastal hazards and catchment flooding and what that looks like in Fungaparoa, please come to presentation two, which is the overview of how those work and what we know in each of the different areas. And our partners, emergency management, will be there to talk about what you can do to prepare and make sure you're ready for any kind of thing that might happen. Now, all of these hazards are gonna be impacted by climate change. They're likely going to get worse over time, and that's what we need to plan for. And to tell you some more about that, I'm gonna pass you over to our specialist consultant. Thanks, Tracy. Um, and I think in terms of um, coastal hazards, um, they are basically coastal processes which impact on people's assets. So um, all hazards are basically just a natural process that is occurring, but it's occurring in a place where we probably don't like it very much. So uh, I think that's, that's probably important. And, and coastal erosion can be slow. It can be just a, a slow, steady, incremental thing that happens over periods of time, or it can be rapid as a result of storms causing damage. And understanding, sort of, again, that those are just the, the natural flow of processes that, that occur uh, over time, and that the hazard comes in when it, it impacts on something that we, we value. So, uh, it's interesting to look at what Walker was saying, his observation of things have changed. Um, certainly that's my experience over the last um, 30 years of looking at the coast. Um, we've seen uh, changes in wind pattern uh, within the harbour estuary areas. Um, we've had slightly higher water since 1994. There's been a, a slight increase in sea level recorded since 94 than uh, the previous 100 years. They're beginning to impact um, areas that previously we haven't seen uh, as much damage or impact coming through. So the projection from um, the climate change models, um, which I'll be talking about in the next slide, is we are going to get a significant increase in sea level rise over the next 100 years compared to the last 100 years that we've observed. And uh, just in context, the last 100 years has been about um, 17 centimetres of um, sea level rise. Um, so even then, over the last 100 years, we've had quite a lot of change in sea level. Um, the projections for the next 100 years are, are for greater levels than that. Uh, as a result of climate change, we're going to see changing rainfall patterns. This can be um, rainfall in different areas, different intensities, um, but the expectation for, for Auckland is more intense and, and short burst duration rainfall. So storms, sort of the cloud burst, and increased um, catchment flooding, and just the sharper peaks and, and more flows coming down the catchment system. And um, tropical storms or extreme storms, both from the southwest, a sort of uh, a predominant wind direction, as well as um, the tropical cyclones from um, the northeast. So both of those events are expected to decrease. Um, they don't believe the, the most significant storms are going to increase. So the really big storms, the bowlers, those kind of things will still be happening about the same frequency, but there will be more storms closer to um, extreme events. And uh, this particular um, pilot, um, as it stressed, it says we're really focusing on what the impact of those climate change events and coastal hazards are on the council-owned land and assets. And uh, another thing to, to note, and um, part of it goes back to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, which is a, a, a founding document in 1994, which sets out how we manage um, coastlines and it starts from a, a frame where um, coastal processes are an important function, they're a natural process, and preserving that natural process is very important, and providing space um, for those processes to occur are also really important. So in terms of um, the, the rules within, or the policies within that state, it's looking at preserving and protecting our natural systems, creating space, because that helps create a, a strong environment and ecosystem and where we live um, and looking at modifying or changing or um, providing protection works only where um, they're absolutely necessary and uh, coastal protection works or seawalls and revetments do not protect the coastal environment they protect the land um, behind the coast 
Um, so it's there for a reason, and protection works in places are necessary, but it's um, only when it is necessary. And I guess the, and the other point that sort of Tracy alluded to is um, it's also costly to do protection work and um, it's not something we can do over 3,200 kilometres of coastline. It's interesting, um, I worked in Holland and in the 90s they, they spend $2 million US per kilometre per year on their coastal um, protection. But they've only got 350 kilometres of coast and they've got 17 million people, so the economics are, are, are quite different. Um, Auckland's got a million and a half people and 3,200 kilometres, we've got the, the exact opposite. So, um, the other thing talking about how things change is um, I often hear people wanting it to go back to how they remember in the 70s or the 50s or the 80s. Um, coastal processes are a continuum, it's continually changing. Um, there isn't a going back to normal, things are, are continually changing and adapting. And one of the observations, if you go for a walk around your, your beautiful cliffs along a, a low tide and you look at that wave cut platform, that's all where cliffs used to be. So when sea levels reached their present levels about six and a half thousand years ago, the Fongapro cliffs were um, tens to hundreds of metres further seaward. Um, than they are now. So over that last um, six and a half thousand years, that, that wave cut platform is, is your relic cliffs that have just been moving back through weathering processes, through um, waves and the like. So we expect that to continue into the future and we expect increased um, stresses from climate change um, impacting on, on those physical processes. So part of understanding um, what is vulnerable in the coastal environment is understanding what the issues are. And I've, I've given a bit of a talk through, I guess, the existing coastal processes that occur. But, um, so this is really focusing on potential climate change effects. So um, the, the graph here at the top with lots of nice pretty colours shows the projected um, a whole range of different scenarios. So what the um, the modelers, the global modelers and um, New Zealand modelers, when they look at climate change, they run a four scenarios typically at looking at future projections of um, emissions into the environment. And um, all of these scenarios have different um, attributes about population, about GDP, all of those influence the kind of carbon that, that gets emitted. And we've got um, four models. The um, Concentration pathway 2.6, which is the, the low um, plot here in blue, shows that if we significantly reduce our emissions from where we currently are, um, we can end up with a net zero carbon. And that's really what the climate change emergency is and what the, um, the central government's um, plan is to try and get down to um, that level, which is sort of the, the, the Paris Agreement um, that was set up a few years ago. Um, at the top, we've got the RCP 8.5 scenario, which is a, a high emission scenario. So what that's saying is population and GDP and the focus on fossil fuels will continue and increase for the next 60, 70 years and then drop quite suddenly. Um, but the, there will be so much carbon in the environment that those temperatures and, um, will continue to increase. So where we are now, um, there's a little 2016 point on the graph here, so it shows we're pretty much on that red line. We're emitting a lot into the environment and that is why we're getting councils and governments looking at climate change emergencies to, to make a change. Something fundamentally has to change. Now in terms of coastal processes, um, one of the things <clears throat> that happens is um, that increased temperature in the atmosphere results in increased sea levels, both from global melt of ice, but also from thermal expansion of seawater. So if you heat water, it expands, and, and that increases sea levels. Um, what we have here on the graph from the year 2000 to the year 2120 along the bottom, uh, we have increases of sea level from zero to 2000, going up to 1.8 metres on, on that axis here. So that shows sea level increase over time, and the four lines, five lines here show and what is going to happen with sea level based on those um, projections. So what you can see um, 100 years from now, 
2,120. Sea levels could be between half a metre to almost 1.4 metres higher than it is um, in the year 2000. So a big range and a big uncertainty. Uh, but somewhere between that range, which is significantly higher than the last 100 years that we've experienced. So once we understand what the processes are, what the climate change scenarios are showing us and the effect of increased sea level rise, increased rainfall, and increased weather events, um, that informs what we um, do in a vulnerability assessment where we look at what is happening. We then have to look at um, what matters most, and those are the, um, the assets that, um, from council, um, for the parks, reserves, and the facilities, and what matters for the communities who use those assets and those, um, those environments. And then the last stage of um, the process is what are the adaptive responses or what can we do about it? And I'll pass that back on to Tracy. Oh, so, yeah, sorry for the management planning approach. Thanks, Richard. So you, this is on you. So you, you've sort of heard um, coastal management plans um, in the coastal environment and public open spaces. It's really diverse and really complex. Um, that's set against a backdrop of finite funding um, and the need to identify cost-effective solutions. Um, coastal, for this reason, coastal management plans need to be adaptive and flexible. So this helps ensure that any investment in the future is focused on the right activities at the right time. And for that to work, it really needs to incorporate the values of the local community. So when considering the long time frames of the CMPs, it's important to remember that our communities are going to outlast the life cycle of any asset that's in the coastal environment. And it's for this reason we're really trying to focus on hearing and understanding those values and experiences that are important to the local community. Um, we, we know that continued pressure from climate change and predicted sea level rise will mean that the parks and public spaces that you value are going to look different in the future. Um, and throughout this we're going to be talking about a lot of technical and scientific analysis that goes in, into these plans and, is, and what all this is based on. And that will inform how we identify a preferred long-term management approach. But it's critical that the experiences that you value, that make these places important to you, how you use them, are captured so that that can be layered into that decision making, can, can influence that technical scientific approach. Because um, it's great to have an asset, but the asset is there for a reason and often that reason is to enable the community to use that space. So we need to make sure that, that the need and the reason comes first and then we can have a meaningful discussion around the asset or the approach that provides that long term. So basically we need your insight. Your insight is going to ensure whatever decisions are taken, the experience that our coastal parks and open spaces currently provide that make them valued to you and to the Auckland region are protected over the next 100 years as, as we evolve through these adaptive pathways. Ooh, sorry. Here we go. So, so the insight we're trying to gain from you, what we're, what we're trying to understand is how you value the coast. What are those experiences um, that are really important to you. We want to understand how you and your friends and family use the coastline, what makes you feel connected to it, and what are the significant experiences that you value. It, it's a new way of looking at it. Council in the past and, and communities sort of default to talking about an asset, about a boat ramp and it's got potholes in it and what colour are we going to paint the toilet and all that kind of stuff. But what we need to establish on this long time frame is what's important, what's valuable, what are those experiences? Is it, is it being able to walk along the low tide beach? Is it to be able to sit on some, a grass area? Is it having a picnic with your family? Is it lying on the beach in the shade and you know, swimming in the sea? All those things. It, it sort of sounds as if it's too obvious and too much common sense. But for us to be able to capture that and articulate it and include it in alongside this technical scientific planning world ensures that 
that these experiences are maintained and carried forward as we go forwards. So um, just sort of, in summary what I'm trying to say, the coastal environment, it's all too easy for the management options we select to change the way people use the space. What's important is the experiences that people value drive our decision making. Tracy. Thanks, Jeff. So what Jeff has said points to probably your number one question is, okay, well, how are we gonna find out what it is that you guys value? Um, so we have a number of ways that you can let us know. The first one is our digital platform. This is called Social Pinpoint. You can find this on our website, which is on the AK Have Your Say page. Can also be um, taken through this QR code. We do have some flyers at the back for those people who are here where you can, all this information is available for you to take with you. Um, but this platform essentially, you, what you can do is it allows you to drop pins and you can type text, you can add pictures, you can have conversations, you can make comments. Anything that you would like to tell us about the coast, you can let us know. Um, the polygons that are on here are surveys. These uh, provide some questions that we need to, we would like you to answer, so feel free to do that. Um, the other way that you can let us know is to come to our open day. This is at the Fungapura Library on May 8th. Uh, our technical team will be there to discuss with members of the public everything you want to know about coastal management planning and how you value the coast. Um, another way that you can be involved is to join the community reference group. Now this is a group of, of community members who are quite interested in the process, in the impacts of climate change, um, in making sure that we're appropriately including the values of the community in the process, and they'll be working alongside us to actually put together some of these adaptive strategies. Um, we still have uh, places available for this. Uh, it is quite time intensive, so be aware that if you would like to join this, it's probably looking about 20 to 30 hours of time over the next couple of months um, to help us with this process. I'm gonna pass you over to Richard again to talk about how it is that we identify risk areas. So this is just gonna be a, a quick step through of how we um, break up Fong Pro into our um, pilot and what are we looking at and what are we going to be um, reporting on. So um, the Fong Pro cell, it extends from Red Beach up um, right through Shakespeare Park and we break that down into communities or units. Or, um, so we've got sort of Manly and Stanwell Bay, so I know it's a small figure, but um, the first thing is getting all the information from Auckland Council, GIS, the population database, the houses, the roads, the three water infrastructures, the parks and reserves, um, and um, break it down into, into these units, because what that means we can do is compare one unit to another. Um, and when we think about how we um, roll this out for a regional assessment, we need some kind of framework at a reasonable scale where we can compare one area with another in, in a consistent and coherent way. So um, the cell, Fongapra, um, the units, and then the information within those units um, and the values. We then look at what the coastal hazards are and um, what the impact of climate change. Now this um, uses existing published information, so NIWA has um, done a lot of work on storm surge around the Auckland coast that's used in the unitary plan. We, we use that information. Um, we've just, Tom Taylor's finished an erosion susceptibility assessment for the Auckland region, and that gives us insight into um, the proximity of the, to the coast of where there is um, in, uh, instability or um, sensitivity to erosion and a, a range of consultants have done catchment flood studies and catchment management plans. So we're using existing published information rather than reinventing the wheel to give us the hazard information and all of those studies have considered some form of future sea level rise. Um, so that gives us the ability to look at what the present um, hazard is, but also what the medium and the long term hazards might be um, with those scenarios. We then um, group the um, elements at risk. We're using the, the living standards framework from Treasury where we look at the full well-being. So rather than just look at economic cost or, or buildings, um, we're looking at the environment. We're looking at social, which is uh, population and, and um, deprivation areas. Um, we're looking at um, ecological areas of significance. 
and we're looking at cultural areas or cultural indicators. And in this instance, what that means is things that have been identified as cultural heritage sites uh, um, within the unitary plan process. And I use the word indicators um, carefully because um, with cultural matters, um, they purely just an indicator of uh, a value that they in no way assign values or even um, um, cost to those kind of things. It's a flag of saying there's something here. Um, the important thing and the, the discussions we're having with Mana Whenua is making sure hazard information is provided and they're helping us with the context of how to frame or how they want to use that information. And for communities too, it's we're showing the results of our assessment and part of the feedback is providing your values into the process that will help understand them and put into context in terms of the vulnerability assessment. The outcome of this, looking at the vulnerability and elements at risk, is we'll be able to quantify what is exposed and what isn't. So if it's exposed, for example, inundation, if um, a property or a, a reserve is inundated, we can work out the area of that and also what areas aren't inundated. So part of an exposure assessment, we can see areas that are likely to be impacted over the short, medium and long term, and those areas which are unlikely to be impacted. Um, where we have information on criticality, so certain flood depths, you get more damage on, on certain things, we also can understand what the vulnerability and the criticality is. So we'll see in that information areas of more or less um, increasing risk. Um, so uh, uh, is climate change going to make the existing situation worse? How much worse? We can quantify that. Um, and that will give us information to help prioritise high risk areas um, and areas of high value and also help identify adaptive management responses to deal with those changes over time. And Tracy's going to just step through the kind of strategies that um, we're going to consider. Right, so uh, we've been talking about adaptive strategies the whole night, so now we get to see what some of that might look like. Um, we have some animated graphics, but um, the main thing is we have three kind of overarching strategies that we can look at. There are within each of those three multiple different options and ways that we can make that happen. But in terms of high level strategies, the first one is what's called no active intervention. This is essentially, another word is kind of do nothing. But what it means is that we're allowing the natural environment to do its course. You're allowing erosion to continue, allowing inundation to do its thing. We're not interfering with the natural environment. And so in terms of what this looks like, in this case for our bench, if we add in the present day, you've got your high tide, and it's not coming near the bench. But it floods whenever you have you know, a big storm event because the water's quite high. Now, if we go 20 years from now with sea level rise, the water will be quite close to this bench. And if you look 50 years, potentially this is flooding at every high tide. And if we do nothing, potentially in 100 years, this bench is flooding almost all the time and is mostly underwater. Now this particular strategy is quite good in areas where there's open land, open space, not much going on. Um, and it is again, it's the strategy that we would choose in an area where we can allow the natural environment to take its course. Now one of the other options we have is called hold the line. This is uh, basically the strategy of protection. Um, and what this kind of looks like in practice, if this is your high tide now, if you make the decision, or we make the decision together to hold the line, in this case, we might build a seawall, might build that wall up. Now, there are many other options that you could choose, including you can build dunes, you can add sand. There are lots of different ways that you can use this particular adaptive strategy, but in this graphic, we're showing you the seawall approach. But if you look at 20 years, that water, because of sea level rise, is now at the wall. And in 50 years, it's starting to go up the wall. And again, in 100 years. Now, this is hold the line. So this is one of the adaptive strategies. Another option that we have is called manage realignment. 
Now again, this is, as with Hold the Line, there are many different ways that you can use this particular type of strategy. You can naturalize the coastline. You can add um, certain types of space, certain kinds of planting. Um, but in this graphic, uh, when you have your present day high tide, and in 20 years when your water rises and you start to reach that seawall, if you decide to realign, what that essentially means is that we move the asset out of the way. We take it back and then we, we allow some space for the environment to do what environments do, to, you know, to erode away, to continue growing the water, <laughs> continue allowing the water level to rise. And so what you can see in 50 years is nothing's being impacted, and again in 100 years. So these are kind of the three high-level strategies that we have. Again, they can look very different in practice, but to give you an idea of what they do look like in practice, I'm going to pass you back again to Richard. Thanks, Tracy. I'm going to just to walk you through um, a few examples. Um, um, Westport Air Airport on the west coast. Um, interesting physical processes. Um, Westport, the, the coastline built out due to um, huge earthquakes on the Alpine Fault several hundred years ago that brought lots of grey, wacky gravels and shingle down to the coast and built the coast out at quite a reasonable rate. We haven't had as many of those earthquakes over the last hundred years, so that material's run out basically from the river systems and now the wave processes are dominating the supply process and resulting in quite long-term erosion. So Westport Airport is um, currently at threat, um, but the line here that you see on the screen, the, the yellow line is an access track to um, a park um, from, from the main road um, that is getting impacted by erosion. So some of the options that we considered in this instance, a mix of both um, retreat and protect is um, they've built a, a rock seawall <coughs> along the um, airport, um, pre preserving that, <coughs> that facility, but they retreated the shoreline where they could and moved the, the road. <coughs> and if you look at just the straight economics, moving a road is um, thousands of dollars, um, building seawalls are, are tens of thousands of dollars, so quite a smart thing, creating a natural system and avoiding um, unnecessary expense and maintaining that connection of the beach, dry beach, um, and factual area. Um, Stanmore Bay is another good example, um, on just around the corner. So, um, looking at the, the February 2018 storm, um, which I'm sure you <coughs> you recall, uh, looking at this photograph, what you can see, or what I can see certainly is. We've got a grass area that sits over the old dune system that's slightly higher as, as you get under the trees. It's been grassed over for amenity, um, but what that means is it's less resilient to shocks compared to a, a natural dune system. So when you get erosion, you get a steep scarp on the beach and um, those um, rocks along the tarp are particularly effective. So a solution of bringing in and providing some additional width of um, dunes and planting creates an environment where those dunes help trap windblown sand. They help build up <coughs> a volume of material on the upper part of the beach that when a storm comes, it's still going to get swept away and you're still going to get some scarping, but that volume means you're not going to get the same erosion that's going to um, act further landward. And a, another good example here in Auckland of, of managed retreat is um, Murawai, the surf club car park um, down at the southern end of Murawai. Um, we've got an image there from 2009 that shows um, the car park quite extended seaweed. It was getting significantly undercut and there was erosion and lots of studies about the size of the wall that they need to build and how they were going to protect um, that car park. Um, a decision was made to provide that space that the dunes need to act as a buffer and relocate um, the car park some 400 metres landward to create a system that could function um, more effectively and the results have been a, a naturalised coastal edge, um, not the same pressures in terms of um, when storms come that there's a, a, a high value asset that people want to protect. So creating, uh, uh, putting nature back and giving nature room to, um, to do its thing. So we're just going to close out now with um, the big picture. Thanks, Richard. Um, so 
as I mentioned when we first kind of started the presentation, Fanga Perella is one piece of this very much larger puzzle where we're talking about the regional coastline of Auckland, that 3,200 kilometers. And um, the strategies that we come up with in any area are very important because they, they highlight to us how we can manage things, how we can do that adaptive pathway. But once we understand that across the whole coastline of Auckland, that's when we can actually plan on how we're gonna do this in practice. That's when we can implement, after we have that regional framework. So it's important for us to know that we are going to make this plan and then we're going to continue to roll out the coastal management plans across the region over the next three to five years. Um, and in the meantime, Council still has its ongoing maintenance, its ongoing renewal, its programs to manage what is there. Because the thing about coastal management plans and this adaptive framework, our decisions are long term. And actually, kind of the earliest that we're going to start to make some of these decisions are in about a decade's time. So we have some leeway to complete this whole process and get our heads around what we need to do. So in terms of this pilot, um, Fanga Perella, uh, how is this going to to work? Well, we have our first, our three public presentations where we're coming to talk to you to provide you some information about a variety of things. This first presentation, as you've seen, is the introduction to coastal management planning, what it is, what it looks like. Presentation two is really focused on those coastal hazards and that catchment flooding and the impacts of climate change. And what does that look like for Fungo Perella? What, what is that? Um, and how do we work with that? Presentation three is going to give an overview of uh, adaptive plans and coastal engineering and coastal processes and how they all link together with community values and what that looks like in practice. Lots of examples. Our open days are where you can come and talk to us to provide insight. And then after our first open day, we'll go into the development process of these adaptation strategies. So we'll be working with the CRG, we'll be working with our Mana Fenable partners, we'll be bringing everything together to come up with a plan for this, for this area. And in open day two, we'll present that plan and the community can, can come to talk to us about it and how, how they feel and how it's working and what they would like to see. And finally, we will write that all up into the report. Now this uh, is starting today, and we expect to have this report done by around um, August. So very quick timeline, but um, here we are. Um, our next presentation, which is that Coastal Hazards presentation, is on April 15th. Um, and if you are interested to know, this is the inundation map for Fung Fro. So if you're interested to know what areas are exposed, um, please come to that presentation. And now I'm going to um, pass back over to Paul, who is going to uh, basically open the floor to questions. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks to all the presenters, um, and thanks for your attention. I know we've covered quite a bit of information tonight, um, but we've, we've really tried to stick with this as an introduction to give you a bit of a feel and a flavour for what's coming up next. Um, it's not going to be a rush process. We, we definitely want to build in the time uh, for interaction with the community. Um, the interaction that we need to have with mana whenua as we work through this process as well. Um, Tracy's helped to explain um, your ability to feed back on this process, either digitally, um, contacting us directly. Um, there's a variety of methods that you can apply there and, and they are listed in the handouts that are at the back of the room. Um, what I might do now is, is open the floor up to questions um, and I'll do a bit of a roving mic so those that want to ask a question maybe can ask it via the mic and then I can direct it um, to, oh, we've got a helper here. Um, I can direct it to who I think from the panel or, or actually council staff in the audience to answer that question. So, who's got a question? Here we go. Just behind you. Hi. One of the things I want to know is that you often uh, do consultation with local authorities and things, but you don't actually listen. Everyone can give their input, like we can all turn, you know, I've watched what happened with Penlink. Every single person that was asked said it's got to be a four lane highway. What did council do? Didn't listen. Everything that we've ever discussed that we think is best for our community, council just totally ignore it. How can we guarantee what we're doing now is going to have any impact at all? It might be a question for me, actually. Um, look, I, I appreciate that question and I appreciate that feedback. It, it's something that we're, we're hearing 
more and more for council. So I'm most definitely wearing my, my acting general manager hat. Um, now um, communities, stakeholder groups, um, even some of the engagement that we're having with mana whenua, that there's a real theme there around, um, we wanna commit to providing feedback, uh, we wanna commit to, to giving you direction, but what's the assurity that council's gonna listen and apply um, what we're telling you? Um, I think all I can say is, and hopefully you've picked up this evening, there's a change in the way that we're trying to engage here and now. Um, we're talking about receiving or understanding how people value the coast, how you value your environment. Um, the work that we're presenting this evening and what we're trying to achieve um, is being better supported and led by central government as well. Um, there's a real change in council around um, some of how we're thinking about policy and direction that needs to be developed at the same time. But we're not seeing it though. Yeah, no, and I think that's a fair, that's a fair point. So um, tonight, tonight really is about an acknowledgement that although we're doing a lot of planning internally, a lot of documentation internally, um, I'll be the first to admit we're not, we're not engaging with communities probably as often, as frequently and meaningfully as we need to. So listening, I'm, I'm hearing that. Um, we're here tonight, um, we've, on, we've very purposefully mapped out a process of multiple presentations, multiple workshops, multiple open days. That gives us the ability at each successive workshop or presentation to reflect back to the community what we've, what we've heard, what we've reflected upon and what we're applying. So um, I, I don't want this to be a talk fest, it isn't a talk fest. Um, we, are, we are applying um, a council team and experts in a way that I think we can achieve something meaningful, meaningful in this space. Um, I, I, I would add, um, I, I, think, I think the timing for these conversations are right at the moment as well. There, there's more of an appreciation and awareness of, of climate change and some of the impacts, the need for um, New Zealand, Auckland globally to do better in this space. Um, it's something that our, um, our local boards and our governing body are picking up on as well. Um, there's support there, um, there's funding being provided to, to, to work our way through these conversations. Um, I guess all I can really say is uh, judge us on how this process sort of transpires. Um, it's a big risk though, this is our community and mm -hmm. it's a real big risk because all we're seeing is we're just being dumped on by unlawful development but we're just getting absolutely hammered, nailed, annihilated and we don't have a voice. And, and so again, I, I hear what you're saying and, and, and we're, we're picking that up. Um, this, is, this is your chance. This is your time. We're listening. Um, please give us your feedback. There's the reference group too. Yeah, uh, good point from Richard. Um, um, there's an opportunity to join that community reference group that we talked about as well. So those are, those are people that are putting their hand up to say, well, residents, community members, I'd like to spend a bit more time in the space. I'd like to work in a bit more of a focused way with the project group to make sure that I'm bringing forward um, concerns, feedback on, on your own behalf and your, the behalf of the community. So um, yeah, I'd suggest that you, you put yourself forward for that group. Another question down the back here. Yeah. Uh, we, been, we moved up here about five years ago, I guess, and uh, for various factors, but one of the uh, contributing factors was the obviously the beautiful beaches in the country, and uh, it's, it's been really great. Now, we like swimming in either Big Mandy or Matakitaki. That one. That one. And a uh, little handy, but in the middle of all these beaches are these damn great uh, uh, drainage pipes leading into the beach. And so I, I have many, you know, a few concerns about the peninsula, but one is the water quality and whether what we're going to be doing here is improving uh, that water quality that flows onto our beach or, or actually eliminate it completely would be really good. Because when you're swimming in the water and you see, you're looking up a damn great pipe and it's dumping goodness knows what into our beach, uh, it doesn't feel good. So my question really is, are we going to be doing anything about the uh, water quality on our beaches, please? Thank you. Maybe another one for me. 
Um, yes, we'll be, we'll be including reference to water quality and, and stormwater outfalls assets as part of our future discussions. Um, so we're working very closely with our partners. You would have seen in our earlier slides, the Healthy Waters Department or unit of Auckland Council um, looping them into those conversations. You're gonna see more of them and hear more from them in some of the future discussions. But it's definitely something that we've heard um, pretty loud and clear actually in the lead up to this, um, this presentation that, that water quality um, and bathing is definitely a sort of a high focus area. So yes, you will hear more um, in, in, in that round um, presentation, probably three, two and three. Two and, three. Um, and we will have representatives from the Healthy Waters Unit here to speak directly to those points. So. Uh, now, um, I think we're all aware that central government has quite a bit of uh, mandatory uh, requirements for emissions and things like that. How much of what we're discussing uh, around this pilot um, has anything to do with the mandate from central government and how much is genuine options? This one's not for me, this one's for Tracy. <laughs> um, yeah, I think New Zealand is in quite an interesting space with the national government policy. So they have their, um, the national government put out the climate change risk assessment for New Zealand just last year, which highlighted some of the issues that they expect to come up. Um, and of course they declared that climate emergency and they're working through what that looks like from the emissions perspective. From the adaptation perspective, which is how we adapt to climate change, which is one of the things we're talking about with this plan, the national government is in the process of putting together the national climate adaptation strategy at the moment. And that fits in with the repeal of the RMA, where they're trying to work through how they can change land use planning to help us plan for the future and to you know, work through uh, making sure that we're mitigating risk, making sure that we're meeting the development needs and all that kinds of stuff. Um, but at the moment, that um, national adaptation strategy uh, is scheduled, I think, to come out in draft next year and then to be finalized the year after that. Thank you. Um, I, I was project director of the National Climate Change Risk Assessment. So um, what central government does absolutely does have an impact on local government and all communities. Um, part of, of this is we do need to have substantive change. And uh, I think Councillor Walker made the point that there's two things um, that we as a country are, are looking at doing. One is mitigation, so reducing our emissions. That will require a change in what we currently do and adapting to those um, shocks and stresses that we ca that are coming here anyway. So whatever we do in the mitigation space, we've still got 50 to 100 years of um, what's projected to be increased storms and, and surges. So if your question is, is there an impact of government on um, uh, uh, all of us? Yes. Um, does that impact some of the choices um, we might be able to make the answer is unfortunately yes too, that there will be a change. Um, what we're looking at is trying to uh, understand value so we can do things that work well for communities. And an example from the Hawke's Bay, I was involved in a similar thing for the Hawke's Bay communities, home line, you've probably seen in the papers where waves just go through your lounge when periods hit 12 seconds. Um, the discussion with that community, and they were passionate about their bit of coast. And what, what I love about my job is everyone on the coast loves their coast. Um, but they had to change because the physical process that were occurring were, were destroying houses, were affecting the whole community vulnerability. Through these um, the kind of workshop processes that we're about to embark on, um, they came to a view that protecting the spirit of the community was the most important thing. And that then changed the question of how, how do you do that? It isn't about the bricks and the mortar, it isn't about the environment um, per se, it is how you preserve that spirit of community um, and then dealing, how do you deal with the, um, those people more or less affected? And I think that that's probably something which we're looking at here and understanding the values will help us understand that process. Any other questions? 
All comments? Can we get into roading? Because that has an impact on our votes. Yep, so there was a there was a question there around roading. So um, roading is being considered with part of the asset work that we're doing um, for these plans, um, and we are partnered with Auckland Transport in this space as well. There, there is, though, a primary focus on the, the council-owned land, council-owned assets in that coastal interface. Um, there are areas for, from a parole where um, the roading's pretty close, some of our smaller bays. Um, Manly Beach, um, Marikatea, um, especially. So, so we will have to have a discussion. Yep, down in Wade River, um, on, the water. on the water. Yep. So we, we will have to have that discussion as part of the wider. Could you do that before you start selling off any more land? I'm thinking of the land opposite Fongaparoa Library. That particular piece of land that's attached to the college. There should be like a massive roundabout because that whole intersection is just clogged. Council owns that land. Why can't, or it's a, why can't we keep that land for council, but actually make the roads work instead of not work? Um, luckily, I'm not a roading expert, and it would be nice to put that question maybe to um, maybe to Auckland Transport in the first instance, just around the roading network and, and some of the land acquisition space. Probably a question better directed to parks, but. Um, slightly outside this conversation for this evening, but, but roading in respect of the coastal environment will most definitely be included. Yeah. Which comes back to housing as well, because that obviously has a huge impact on emissions and what that does to our environment and our coastal community. Yep. And our ecosystem. And our ecosystem, yep. yeah. Yep. Huge impact. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. And it's probably important. Oh, sorry. It's worth noting that this process is a sorry. It's worth noting that this this process is a tool to forward those conversations, and it will it will be an underlying piece of work that will inform other and give you um, evidential, you know, hard captured information to forward those conversations with. So it's it's not that it might not solve that problem but it will be a tool you can use to have that conversation and try and solve that, that problem moving forward. So don't discount it because it doesn't directly answer the question. It's a tool to get there. But when you have those conversations for years and you feel frustrated because they just don't go anywhere. Yeah. Yep, so again, um, for those that didn't hear that, the, the comment there, just, just um, a level of frustration around um, conversations, community, council, and a feeling that things just aren't going anywhere. Um, again, just reiterating, we're trying to do better in that space. We really are. We're Not listening. on the telephone. What's that? Not on the telephone. I, I keep yep. logging and keep logging. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so, so, so we're here. We, we, we like face-to-face -face interaction. I, I should have led actually with a bit of an apology that um, we were hoping to have these conversations um, a lot earlier than this. Um, in the year, but COVID, um, COVID scuppered our plans twice actually, um, with respect to lockdowns. Um, th there was some, there was some thinking around moving this to an online platform discussion, but we really wanted to keep the face-to-face -face, um, interaction for those that, that that wanted to attend and be part of these discussions. Um, it's nice that we're streaming um, to those that are joining us online as well, because that, that means we get a, a broader audience for those that have young families and can't make it from a grower. Um, but we're going to keep this face-to-face -face interaction happening whilst we stream as well. Just trying to get the bleeding right. Thank you. Just happy to make a comment to follow on, up on the, the gentleman's question that goes to council and, and the government. Um, I would suggest that over a period of time uh, the government is going to be a critical driver because the the costs of dealing with what we're talking about here are going to be far more than what our council can fund. So what will probably happen, and I think it's uh, probably uh, a reasonably intelligent guess, is we'll have something like the, uh, the Earthquake um, Commission and the, the money that is put into a fund that will assist in dealing with adaptation around the coastline. Because it's a huge issue around uh, New Zealand. And that will be a major driver in respect of what solutions are looked at because there will be some 
situations where properties will have to be bought because it's just going to cost too much to deal with them or the community as a whole may agree that that's not the best solution. Any other questions? No. All right, well I guess all that's left to do is, is thank you all. Um, we really appreciate your time um, making it out here on a, on a weeknight. Um, really appreciate your time and your, um, your attention um, and, and appreciate the questions as well. Um, we've noted those. Um, I'd like to end on the, on the statement that we are listening. Um, we'll continue to listen um, and we'll continue to demonstrate that we're, we're doing something about what we're hearing um, from the community. So that's a really important part as well. Um, maybe just ending on a reminder of the sequence of discussions that we're having um, and a reminder um, of the next presentation on the 15th of April. It would be really good to see um, you all back here on the 15th of April um, and, and maybe a few others that you might want to um, I'm convinced to come along. Um, the conversations are going to progress into a bit more detail around hazards and I'm, I'm reasonably certain um, that, that that's going to draw um, some interest and, and, and a different line of questioning as well. So it'd be great to see you all back here. Thanks for your time and um, appreciate your effort. Thank you.